So, when you're really invested in a video game, you don't just want to win to save the world or to see the ending. Sometimes the only thing that keeps you going is the opportunity to kick the absolute crap out of the main villain. After your arch nemesis murdered your family, took over society, or just is really, really annoying, there's nothing that'll make you happier than wiping the floor with them. But there are certain games where you never actually get that chance. Sometimes the antagonist will die preemptively or escape, depriving you of putting that bullet in the skull or blowing them to kingdom come. So let's take a look at them today as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 video games where you never fight the main villain. Number 10. Zachary Comstock and the Songbird Bioshock Infinite In Bioshock Infinite, Father Zachary Hale Comstock rules the floating city of Columbia with an iron fist. Using dogmatic rhetoric, the charismatic prophet has his people lapping up his every word. So, when he calls the protagonist Booker DeWitt a false shepherd who must be destroyed, our hero finds himself an enemy to all almost everyone in the city. Even though Comstock wields great power, it's not too surprising that Booker doesn't face the self-proclaimed messiah in combat since he's obviously not much of a fighter. Considering Booker is able to take on Uncle Sam robots, Zeppelins, and literal ghosts all by himself, it's not too out of left field when he kills the old codger without engaging in fisticuffs. But since Comstock uses a colossal construct called the Songbird to fight his battles, you'd think that the Avery Automaton would serve as the final boss, right? But there is no such encounter. Although it is cool that you do get to control the songbird in the last section, it's a pity that Bioshock Infinite has two diverse villains and you don't fight either of them. Number 9. General Scales – Star Fox Adventures Now, Star Fox Adventures was a disappointment to the franchise, the first of many actually, and for developers rare. Having said that, you have to commend the developers for trying something different. Instead of an on-the-rails shooter, this GameCube title is an action-adventure that has Fox McCloud out of his R-wing for once to kick some lizard butt. Although Andros is Star Fox, Fox's nemesis, a reptilian warlord called General Scales, serves as this game's antagonist, or so it seems. As Fox reaches Scales' quarters, the lizard despot leaps from the ceiling, preparing to finish the Star Fox leader off. And then, well, he just stands there. Despite wielding a double-pronged hook and sword, Scales won't attack under any circumstances. The instant the player tries to hit him, Andros suddenly appears out of nowhere, urging Scales to give up. After Fox defeats his old foe, the game ends, without mentioning what happened to the warmongering general. Even though it was cool to see Andros again, it was disappointing to say the least how the game just built up general scales as the be-all and end-all only to perform a last-minute bait-and-switch for the sake of fan service. Number 8. Silas Volkmeyer – Battletoads in Battle Maniacs Just before each level in Battletoads in Battle Maniacs, the Dark Queen appears in a cutscene to antagonise our amphibious heroes, Rash and Pimple. Because you see this would-be world conqueror throughout, it might have slipped your mind that she's not actually the main villain. Queenie is actually playing second and banana to the real threat, Silas Volkmeyer. So, after you defeat the Dark Queen, you assume that the true final battle is about to begin, right? But after the seductive supervillainess is vanquished, she skedaddles onto Silas's spaceship and just flies away. And after you blast the vessel with three well-timed missiles, the game just ends, with the titular toads never meeting the main villain. Because Silas only appears in the introduction, you may have totally forgotten about him. Heck, you wouldn't even know he was in the game if you skipped the cutscene. Stranger still, the story could have easily worked without Silas playing any part of it. If the Dark Queen was the mastermind behind everything, it would have had no effect on the plot whatsoever. Why the developers bothered implementing Silas Volkmar into the story in the first place is baffling considering, well, he doesn't do anything. Number 7. Vanat Final Fantasy XII After a street urchin called Van breaks into a Dalmascan palace, he gets caught up in a plot to hunt magical crystals alongside sky pirates, as you do. Since we all know how quickly a Final Fantasy plot escalates, it isn't long before our hero is caught in a magical war with a king who's been manipulated by an ancient entity called Vanat to reshape humanity. Now, even though this king is a titan in the political world, he is but a pawn to Vanat. After the power-hungry regent has served his purpose, you assume that Vanat will just cast him aside. Instead, Vanat empowers the king with all of its power in the final confrontation, transforming him into a godlike being. And although the king is fueled by Vanat, Van never actually battles this interdimensional being directly. Because you see, when you defeat this former regent, you'd think that this is the moment where Vanat discovers guards its lackey and takes on Van itself, but instead, Vanat gives the king more power, forcing you to duke it out with the wicked monarch once more. But the big question is, why? Considering Vanat has been responsible for all of the actions in the story, it's odd how this nebulous 
ridiculous deity just passes its magical abilities onto its minion and just sits out the last battle entirely. Number 6. Dark Star. No More Heroes. In No More Heroes, you play as Travis Touchdown, the 11th best hitman according to the United Assassins Association. Desperate for recognition, our katana-wielding anti-hero vows to kill the 10 best assassins so that he can be crowned top dog. And for the longest time, you have no idea who the main villain actually is. You don't know what he looks like, his backstory, or his name. But since he is the best of the best, this ominous foe is built up tremendously. So when you finally come face to face with the world's greatest hitman, Darkstar, you can't help but get hyped. And just to elevate the anticipation further, he pulls out a 100-foot-long energy sword, emphasizing that you're about to take part in the fight of your life. But before you've had a chance to land a single blow on Darkstar, Travis's half-sister Jean comes out of nowhere and dismembers him. Your psychotic sibling then challenges Travis, serving as the final boss. Even though this moment is deliberately anticlimactic, it's still a shame that you don't duel with the world's best assassin, considering that that was the entire game's premise. Number 5. The Panther King Conquer's Bad Fur Day. In Conquer's Bad Fur Day, our fuzzy hero finds himself in conflict with the tyrannical Panther King. After the feline ruler notices his table is rather wobbly, he attempts to capture Conquer, believing that this foul-mouthed squirrel's body will help prop it up. Yes, that is the actual story. Because of the Panther King's imposing figure, you expect this guy to be a force to be reckoned with when he throws down with Conquer in the climax. And since Conquer's Bad Fur Day has the adorable rodent battling sentient poo, a big bollocked boiler, and a caveman with a micro penis, you would assume that the final boss encounter is going to be equally absurd. Although the showdown is as zany as you'd expect, it's not actually against the Panther King. As the crowned kitty prepares to dispose of Conker, an alien suddenly bursts from his chest, killing him instantly. And after you dispose of this extraterrestrial, the game just ends. Even though it's pretty hilarious to brawl with a xenomorph ripoff, it was a shame that Conker never tangled with the Panther King, since he was a genuinely intriguing and charismatic villain. Number 4. Onaga Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance kicks off with Quan Chi and Shang Tsung joining forces after discovering the mummified army of the Dragon King Onaga. Using their dark magic, the two sorcerers revive the battalion, hoping to use them to control the realms. Because Onaga is constantly mentioned and visible in Raiden's ending, you're practically waiting for him to pop up at some point. But after defeating Quan Chi or Shang Tsung in the main campaign, the credits just roll, with Onaga nowhere to be seen. Now, because Deadly Alliance has hundreds of secrets, many players just assumed that they had to complete a series of tasks in order to face off against against the Dark Emperor. But after you unlock every character, open all 676 caskets in the crypt, and complete conquest mode with each combatant, you will find that you get, well, absolutely nothing. Instead, you unlock a man made of fire and a guy covered in light bulbs. Brilliant. The Dragon King may have been the overarching villain in the follow-up, but it was still anticlimactic how he never showed up in Deadly Alliance, considering that he's mentioned every five bloody minutes. Number 3. The Elusive Man Mass Effect 2 and 3 Throughout the Mass Effect series, Commander Shepard is assisted by an elusive man called, uh, well, the elusive man. Since you're both at odds with the Reavers, this enigmatic figure helps Shepard against the Collectors and offers his own ships in his mission. He was even nice enough to resurrect Shepard when he bloody well died in Mass Effect 2. But when the elusive man tells Shepard he intends to control the Reapers rather than destroy them, the commander realizes that he poses a bigger threat to humanity than anything else. So when Shepard finally confronts him in Mass Effect 3, you'd expect some sort of throwdown, right? But no, that's not the case. No matter what way you answer his questions, the conversation always ends with Shepard shooting him dead. Interestingly, the elusive man was meant to be a more traditional boss fight by mutating into a giant beast, but the developers believed that this idea was too cliched, and so scrapped the idea entirely. The creators also believed that a standard boss fight would have contradicted the philosophy of the elusive man since he posed the threat intellectually, not physically. And you know what, on balance you actually have to say that yes, this was the right call, but still, it would have been nicer to have a little bit of combat, right? Number 2. Ira Hogeboom and Harlan Fontaine L.A. Noir. L.A. Noir follows rookie cop Detective Cole Phelps as he cleans up the streets of Los Angeles. As he quickly works his way up the ranks, he finds himself in foot chases, car chases, shootouts, and brawls with bank robbers, gangsters, and arsonists. Even though you gun down hundreds of crooks, though, there's quite a few villains that you never face off against. Mickey Cohen is the city's biggest mafioso, and yet he never gets his comeuppance. Phelps's boss, Captain Donnelly, covers up the identity of a serial killer and gets away with it scot-free. However, there's one villain you feel like you're absolutely going to face, and that's Dr. 
Dr. Harlan Fontaine. After he manipulated Phelps' old war buddy, Ira Hogeboom, to burn down houses, Phelps found himself at odds with the mad doctor. Because Fontaine's machinations tie in with all of Phelps' cases, it seems sensible that the two would eventually meet. However, Fontaine is murdered by Hogeboom before he and Phelps even cross paths. So when you discover that Hogeboom has kidnapped Phelps' partner, you assume that he's going to be the final boss, right? Well, even though that sounds like a sensible idea, he's shot dead by Phelps' associate in the last section before you have a chance to fight him. And number one, the G-Man, Half-Life. If you look towards the Sector C line in the introduction of Half-Life, you'll spot the interdimensional bureaucrat known as the G-Man. Nearly everybody misses him here on their first playthrough, but it's a significant moment since it highlights how this malevolent administrator is ever-present, watching over our hero, Gordon Freeman. Even though the nameless agent keeps appearing throughout, he's always just out of reach. Because he's also an enemy to the Combine, he's technically an ally to Freeman, and will assist you in your missions when he can. But the G-Man has made it unmistakably clear that he cares little for human life. He sees Freeman as a means to an end, and will dispose of him when he's no longer proving useful. Despite the fact that the G-Man lurks in the shadows in every Half-Life installment, Freeman and his allies have never had the opportunity to fight him. Even though the franchise has a lot of epic moments, there's probably nothing that would bring players more satisfaction than facing the G-Man in battle and wiping that crooked smile off of his face for good. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 video games where you never fight the main villain. I hope that you enjoyed that, my friends. And let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ, but the O is a zero, or Instagram, where it's the same handle, RetroJ, but the O is a zero. It'd be great to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself with love and respect, my friend, because you deserve all the best things in life, all right? Like love, happiness, and success. And don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise. I know I bang on about it a lot at the end of these videos, but I truly believe it, and I just want you to go and live a healthy, happy life, all right? Big love to you, my friend. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.